Right, Professor Gelding, thank you so much uh, for a very, very, very uh, interesting, inspiring, also critical, probably also controversial thoughts um, on a variety, ish, variety of issues. Um, you were both um, positive with the EU in terms of its history. Uh, you called it a, uh, what, what were your exact a words? Glittering a glittering success in bringing together the European countries. <laughs> but yet, at the same time, um, you are critical of the fact that it hasn't translated this in its external relations, and you laid out some very concrete examples and steps that would have to be done, especially in relations to different regions, uh, also uh, kind of uh, addressing its colonial past and uh, um, amongst other things. So a lot of food for thought, a lot of um, yeah, proposals and dreams uh, and concrete um, uh, recommendations as well. Now. Uh, this is food for thought for over to you. For about 30 minutes, we have Q&A. Any kind of uh, questions, comments, um, no limits, no questions of limit. So uh, please, over to you. Ah, uh, I think we need the microphone for this as well. Can you, Matthias? Does it work? How does it work? I give it a technical person. There. For me, it could be more than half an hour. I'm in good shape, but you know, these young people have to go to bed early. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Thanks. Could you can state your name and affiliation, please? Hi, uh, my name is Maria. I am a PhD student at the UNB. Um And my question is basically, you were talking about how to talk to the parties in a conflict. But, and, and you were describing the kind of questions that you were um, asking them. But how do you choose who is a party in a conflict? Do you maintain the same parties that they, that they would tell you? Or would you go and look for whom else could be a party in this conflict? Thank you. They announce themselves. Don't worry about that part. <laughs> and I can tell you they will knock on some door and say, why didn't you talk with me too? So I'm invited to Nepal, let us say, three times. And I'm invited by the Nepali Human Rights Commission, respected by all parties. And um, you start with Maoists and Royalists. Afterwards it becomes more complicated, but it is not so difficult. And uh, sometimes you see the problem is to say this is about enough. And that is when you have a feeling that nothing new is coming up. And you could ask a second question, which could have been just as important as your very first and good question. How do you make them talk? By asking them, what do you want? And the problem is not to make them talk, Maria. The problem is to somehow make them stop at some point. Because nobody has asked them that question, you see. They've only been told how bad they are. And nobody has <coughs> respected and tried to go into how would you organize this and that. Aha, uh -huh, you win more autonomy for your nation. How do you organize it? And things of that type, you see. They talk endlessly. So at some point you have to say thank you so much. Thank you. So we go around the image of the future, the positive image, the more negative image of what has happened, the positive past, what was good in the past, and the horrors of the future. And I can guarantee you when you're through with that, you as a mediator know a lot, and they know more about themselves. And then you ask them for the second round. <coughs> it is very fatiguing. And I as a mediator, just to reveal my, uh, one of my many weaknesses. I am sometimes sitting thinking, these human beings, can't they invent something new? I have heard this one before. But you listen patiently. That's your task. Not to be irritated. But when it comes to point four, what are you most afraid of? And you are talking with women, have Kleenex ready. And lots of it. So the Kleenex industry have much to earn from mediation by the transcend method. If you bring hardened men around the table to so-called debate it or negotiate, you don't need Kleenex. You're only wasting your time. 
I would say. So thank you. Professor Gatun, uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first, uh, sorry, I'm Mohammed Shafi from Saudi Embassy. From? Saudi Mission to the EU. From Saudi yes, Embassy. Saudi Mission to the EU. Sorry. I have just a question. What do you think about the European uh, action or foreign policy, uh, European foreign policy action after the event, uh, after the Arab Spring events? Thank you. Confused, totally confused. First of all, I'm not sure it was only Arab, and secondly, I'm sure it was not only a spring. It is multi-season, <laughs> multi-year, multi-decades, and you have a lot of others mixing into it. And I think the European Union, I'll try to give a little bit extensive answer to your very important question. You see, if you look at it historically, the Arab world has been through three empires. We're talking about 22 countries and 350 million people, and Saudi Arabia, your country, is a very important one. Mainly Sunni, but with the Shia Gulf Coast, and Bahrain, and Iran quite close. So you have the Shia Sunni inside yourself. But having said that, the first empire was the Ottoman. It was about four centuries, but it was Muslim. After Sykes-Picot, the second empire was Western imperialism, colonialism. And it started with the Italian bombing from planes, women and children in oases in Libya, and saying it had a very good moral impact state terrorism at its worst and that was 1911 in 2011 the prime minister of italy apologized it is very rare that a european prime minister apologizes for anything his name was berlusconi and you might say he has a couple of things to apologize for <laughs> so maybe he was projecting his own <laughs> on 1911 instead I know Libya from the inside, it had a very good impact. And to them, Berlusconi's reputation didn't matter so much. So the fact that one country at least had done it. We are looking at England and France to apologize for Sykes and Pico. It hasn't come yet. Now having said that, in 1956 something very important happened. And that was Nasser nationalizing the Suez Canal. And England and France, two leading members of what was yet to become the European Community, because the Treaty of Rome was not en vigueur, that was 1st of January 58, attacking with the help of Israel. And the United States saying, no, stop it. Why did the USA no? because they want to run it themselves. And after some years, in 1967, they have been running it together with Israel. So you have the Arab world to a large extent under US-Israel command. Now that brings European Union into a difficulty. On the one hand, you have Jewish fundamentalism, hard Zionism. I have no problem with soft Zionism. I belong to the one who is totally happy with Israel as a country with 1967 borders, with friendly relations to Arabs and Muslims, no problem. But the hard Zionism is an Israel without an eastern border, an expansion without limit. And the European Union doesn't dare talk about it for fear of being called anti-Semitic. And Israel is very cleverly using that grip on the European Union. And we all know perfectly well that a major country had a main responsibility, but the others cooperated. As a matter of fact, the country that handed over most, the highest percentage of Jews, was Norway, my country. I'm ashamed. You have that one. Then you have the Christian fundamentalism of a country that sees itself as chosen by God, 
and for that reason being exceptional, exceptionalism of the US. And the European Union have very great difficulties coming to grips with that. That means that the European Union cannot do what they should do, <coughs> mediate creatively in this conflict. You cannot do it without once in a while dropping an honest word about Israel and US. So what they do that is to talk about Muslim fundamentalism instead. It exists. There's no doubt about that. It exists. It has, in my view, essentially two forms. One is in the Shia Sunni split, which is very, very important, where the European Union could play an important role by telling what happened in 1985 in Augsburg when the Protestants and the Catholics came to an agreement. It's unknown to most Europeans. You see, Europeans are ignorant also about themselves because occasionally Europeans do good things. It does happen. Now, the point that I'm making is the fundamentalism of having been trampled upon, which they have been, and thinking you have an unlimited right to hit back. The Islamism. And it's called defensive violence. Now this should be critiqued, and they would have come much further than non-violent way. And I'm saying that when I am in the Muslim world, which I am very often. And I can just tell you as one little footnote that at one of these Muslim conferences I asked them, why do you invite me? You know perfectly well I'm not a Muslim. No, you're not, Professor Galtung, but you have one advantage. You can talk five minutes about Islam without making mistake. <laughs> so I said, what happens in minute number six? They say, you are wise enough to stop. <laughs> you know your limits. And we are not used to Westerners who can talk five minutes. They make mistake already in the first sentence when they start some babble babble about jihad. So having said that, I think the European Union has a very difficult situation and is almost paralyzed. And for that reason I don't expect much. And yet I would hope they could move forward. You see in Syria, you have the internal conflict which I analyze as a minority dictatorship about in conflict with a majority dictatorship. Then you have the geopolitical game with all kinds of countries centered. And the European Union is somehow at the periphery of that one, but uh, in it through its members. And of course the basic members are the veto powers in the Security Council, so that would be France and England. And they are old colonial powers, they are the sykes picot countries, they are the worst possible. Couldn't be worse. Then you have Turkey, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Qatar, you have a couple of other countries, and Putin has lifted that game up to a higher level. But at the bottom of it you have the fundamentalisms I mentioned. So long answer to your short question. Sorry about it. And you are, of course, filled with comments. I have, uh, have no comments, thank you. No comments. <laughs> could, you, could you hand over to the lady next to you, yeah. Esther, and then yeah. just next to you? And then we have Richard, and then I think Anthony. The microphone. Ah, sorry, no, sorry, Richard first. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, thank you, Professor Gold. Yeah, it's on. Um, I could ask you 25 questions, but I'll ask you the nastiest one of all, and that is, why did the Oslo Accords fail? Why do I? Did the Oslo Accords fail? 19 Norwegians, clever Israelis. There was a role for the US. The Israelis, this was 20 years ago, you know, 1993, that was signed, not in Oslo, but in the park outside the White House with the huge Clinton with one hand on Arafat's shoulder and the other one on Rabin and making them shake hands, which uh, Rabin didn't do very willingly. But leaving that point aside, I think you have to see the fan how fantastically clever the Israelis are in forwarding the goals of hard Zionism which is expansion. It is Eretz Israel, the big Israel. And they told the Norwegians, 
we do not want to negotiate with the Americans, we want to negotiate with you. Because the new Norwegians were naive enough. And that the Americans at least had some sense of what was going on. And what was going on was expansion. So during the negotiation period, the settlers expanded. And after the Oslo Accords were so-called signed, it expanded even more. Israel got the breathing period. The world had the illusion that something called peace was going on. Something called expansion was going on. Why didn't the Norwegians understand that? <laughs> well, we are naive. We are small and naive. I'm a little bit less naive. And that's because I've been traveling much around the world and seen quite a lot of things. But my naivete comes out in the idea that somewhere there is a solution that could work. So for me, the solution is the Middle East community of Israel with the five Arab neighbors. And the five Arab neighbors are Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, fully recognized, and Egypt. And it reminds me of Germany with five other countries called Benelux, France, and Italy. The arrogant France, and for Israel, the arrogant Egypt. You have two old, arrogant countries to try to steer the process to some extent. Well, Germany accepted it, which is much to Germany's honor. And out of it came the glittering success inside the European Union. We haven't had a Middle East community yet. And it's not even on the table. What's in the table is the one-state solution and the two-state solutions. Forget about it. What I believe in is a recognized one country called Palestine. A two-state solution inside a six-state solution, the community I mentioned. And then an organization for security and cooperation in West Asia. I call it 12620. 12620, and about this I can then talk endlessly. I mean, that is the kind of speech I'm giving in Arab countries. And they stand up and say Israel is illegitimate from the very beginning. And I say, yes, it is illegitimate from the very beginning. But I'm not sure that you lived there 4,000 years ago. I'm not quite sure about that. Maybe you also have a myth. And I agree with you that it's problematic to base your legitimacy on what happened 2,000 years ago. So why don't you agree that you can exchange, that you accept these, the Jewish myth if the Jews accept yours? Yeah? That the Philistines in the Bible are the same as the Palestinians today, which is not so absolutely obvious. So I stand by 12620. And I think the Oslo Accords were very far from it. And uh, the Israel strategy has been from the very beginning never to say where the eastern border is. They only say that it is secure and recognized. Haha. <laughs> How about Himalaya, my dear friends? How about that one? Looks kind of secure, doesn't it? But it might be a little bit far even for your extremists to justify the Jewish population. There were Jews in India from a very early stage on. You can build it on that one. They were in China too. But 1967, with some modifications. That's where you stop, my friends. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, question, I think, uh, Esther? Over there, and then yeah. Okay. My name is yes. Uh, my name is Esther Rain. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute for European Studies. Uh, many thanks for your re really for your refreshing talk. It's uh, compared to all the diplomats we often have in uh, Brussels, is quite uh, refreshing. My question goes about way to the retired. <laughs> <laughs> Invite them after retirement, it sounds better. Yeah, Thank you. Do that, yeah, sure. Like retired generals, you see. Yeah. Um, my question goes about what when we have a conflict and one party denies structurally that it is involved. I, For example, the Rwandan involvement in the Eastern DRC, it just continues on the line, we are not involved, we are not responsible. What do you do? Do you force them? Do you use sanctions? Do you... And then it's also related to the burden of our colonial history, of course. What, what do we do in these kind of cases? I cannot force them, but I can visit them and say, so sad that you 
don't want to participate in this process because there is a process going on and it will affect you in the future. And I can tell you in general they say, what is this process you're talking about? So I try to say something, and something that may happen. And what comes then? <laughs> well, you can talk with my assistant. And I can tell you, I go for 29 years old lady assistants to the assistant foreign minister. Because that is usually that's a young person, it's a woman who has made up her mind about these males on top of her. And um, I come back with a vengeance when that 29 years old lady grows up. So you ask me what do I do and I tell you what I do. Uh, thanks. Anthony? Antonia Tormann, also at the Institute for European Studies. Um, I don't want to jeopardize the, the, the talk on, on Israel-Palestine, but here you have um, uh, two parties that have been in dispute for as long as they can remember, and, and probably as long as they can't remember, because they, they already started generations ago. How do you deal with conflicts of that style? What are the questions that you ask there? Because you said, can you remember how it was before and things like that, here you can't, because they don't remember how it was before, uh, they only have hits. I don't remember what it was before, but when I ask them, they say, my grandfather used to tell me that it was better in the Ottoman period, that Jews and Christians and Muslims lived together and had no major problem. And the problem came with the, right, the Jewish immigration, and then, of course, from 1898, the Zionism from Basel. That's where the problem came, according to them. But on the other hand, the idea that Jews belong here was internal to people, and they accepted it. The question is what shape it takes. And now we can go through the complicated history. But you asked me, what do you do? Well, I do essentially two things, in addition to talking with them, and these are tough talks. And the first thing is to try to put on the wall a possible solution, and I call it 12620. And um, I then invite people to critique it and to come up with something better. Now, the response from Israel hard Zionism, which is in power in Israel right now, the response is, we are not interested. We are interested in expansion. And the question is, expansion to which point? So that I do, of course, the first would be to Jordan, and that means, under the idea that the Palestine after 1922 should be theirs, when Churchill divided the mandate in Jordan and Palestine. And the second line is, no, that's Netanyahu's very explicit line, Jordan belongs to us, it's Palestine. We were assured by the British, a Jewish home in Palestine. Palestine at that time was up to Iraq, when Churchill divided it. Because Churchill was as anti-Semitic as the famous lord behind the Balfour Declaration. Get the Jews out of England and to the Holy Land. But Churchill was so much in love with his favorite colony, Iraq, that he was afraid that these tricky Jews would get hold of Jordan and then threaten Iraq. So he divided Palestine in two. This is history. That's what happened. And the third line is the biblical line. It is Genesis 15:12, where the Eternal One said to Abraham that I give you, you will be my chosen people, and I give you the land from the river in Africa to Euphrates. So that is 
Probably those are the three borders that are known in history and from culture. So I can then ask, you know, a hard scientist, which one do you stand for? And he says the following. I stand for not declaring an eastern border. Ben Gurion started, and it has been a success. The difficulty comes the moment we declare it. We have just said it has to be secured and recognized. Well, I then say, you want secured and recognized, because you want peace. I'll tell you the road. You make peace and you'll get a secure, recognized border. That's what Germany did. And Germany has even been able to cleverly transcend the Ordenaise and be able, in a sense, to get into the lost territories in Poland because Poland, as a European Union member, makes an open border. And all the Kowalskis discovered their Meyer Miller past, what I call the Meyer Millerization of the Kowalskis. <laughs> and that process is beneficial to both parties, and it works well. So that is again a part of the glittering success. But that success can be repeated other places. Now, I understand the hard Zionist politics. I understand that I think this is very clever. But my Lord, the suffering, the social side on the Palestinians, the deprival of identity, the lack of the right of a nation to have a state of its own, the uncertainty about the future, the horrible war, all of that suffering comes up and weighs much more heavily than the cleverness of some hard Zionist tragic. So what do I then see as the solution? I'll be quite frank about it. Increasing delegitimation of Israel and increasing legitimation of Palestine. If all the European Union countries recognize Palestine, they'll simply recognize it. And somebody says, but where are the borders? No problem. We have another country without borders we have recognized called Israel. <coughs> so we are used to that. No problem. We take it from there. You might also consider making an ambassador for a country that colonizes another people, the Shasha Dafet, degrading. And I see such things in the future, and the Israelis see such things in the future, but they see something even worse. And the worst thing that could happen, and which will probably happen, is the Af South African scenario. That the day comes when Washington says, you are a liability. It's not only the dog wagging the tail, and Obama being the physiological link between dog and tail. Not only that. But you are even dragging us into policies that makes us the target of world aggressiveness. Not only 9-11, but also world contempt and suspicion about our alternatives. It's not in our interest. So what I did was to tell the apartheid regime, your time is up, get out. And they will do that to the hard Zionist regime sooner or later. Unfortunately, on the wrong basis, there is now an enormous anti-Semitism in the US. You just go to YouTube, just have a look at YouTube, and you will find a fascist anti-Semitism. Future American leaders will have to deal with that, one way or the other. And what I am now saying as a scenario is what the hard Israelis are most afraid of. And I think it is going to happen, let us say, within five to ten years, something like that. Uh, thank you. My name is Yuri Kaplan. I'm from Not to have weapons and not to have money, so that you could not threat uh, 
because of threat to people. I didn't get the last point, if you could repeat that. You were talking about the agreement to get rid of chemical weapons, yes. and then you said... Then I, I came back to what you said about your advantage, about yourself being an NGO, and having the advantage that you didn't have weapons to threat people, and you didn't have money to corrupt them. And I was wondering, um, in how far would you say that uh, forced diplomacy actually played a role in the agreement reached to destroy the weapons, as it did in the Dayton agreements, for example, in the Bosnia. Let us be aware of a disagreeable fact, namely that getting rid of chemical weapons is not solving the Syrian problem. No, it's not. It doesn't. Syrian problem has to do with the construction of Syria, the political construction of Syria. It solves another problem, and that is where Putin enters, and I call him the, the Putin genius. It sort of neutralizes, to a large extent, <coughs> the power game, the international power game. By, um, you know, he did something almost incredible. He got Obama off the hook. Because Obama wanted to hit militarily, but couldn't get the Congress resolution he wanted. The UK Parliament was against it, so he lost the special relation to Britain. The majority of the American people was against it, and Pentagon was against it. And Pentagon simply said, we don't want to fight that war, it's a non -starter. And uh, they were afraid of being dragged into the ground and suffered the ignominy of the kind of brutalities that they committed in Iraq and Afghanistan, and to a less extent in Somalia, much less extent. So that's the chemical weapons, in a sense, neutralizes for the time being the international political game of the usual suspects. And uh, makes it possible to concentrate, focus more on Syria. I would say. So that's where I see an opening. At the same time, Americans are now suffering the um, degradation as a second-rate world power. And seeing Putin calling the cards, which must be quite tough for him. So the question is, how are they going to handle Can they live with that? And European Union being ambivalent and not knowing where to go. I think we have time for two more, two to three more questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just it's no. My problem are these young people and their energy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, <laughs> please go ahead, uh, Professor Galton. Uh, you, in your talk today, you seem to have suggested for the legitimacy of politics based on religion, which itself has had uh, readings and interpretations which are extremely masculine. No, but having said that. The communication that you are suggesting between Europe and the notion of another, what is that meeting ground uh, uh, for uh, regions uh, which may superficially may have uh, a politics based on withdrawing itself from religion to politics uh, which has had critical respect for religion to politics which is which bases itself on religion? What is that true uh, meeting uh, ground beyond the good and bad to quote in terms of Rumi uh, for for this communication to work up? I think the basic point would be to have respect for worldviews, <laughs> including secular worldviews. And one secular worldview in Iraq and Syria was the Ba'ath Party. It was an effort to secularize the country. But it was also associated with Adam Socialism, and that didn't endear them to the United States of America. So. If we could learn a little bit more tolerance and pluralism and dialogue, it would help an awful lot. And um, I myself um, belong to those who try to find good, positive things in all religions and try to be less worried about the bad things. And uh, we call it in a book by myself and Graham McQueen, McQueen from Canada, Professor of Religious Studies. We call it um, Select Boldly and Eclect Boldly. So I take from Judaism, for instance, the emphasis on dialogue. 
<coughs> of Christianity I take from Jesus Christ the compassions, the conscience and the Samaritan work and not the construction of the churches and the enormous monstrosity called the Vatican and the Vatican was built on the model of the Roman Empire and some of the model of the Roman Empire is found in the Brussels Empire you know, but maybe they don't talk so good Latin and they don't have Kikro yet, so maybe the speeches are not up to the same level. We'll see. Now from Islam I take the closeness and the sharing. And so on. You see, you can work at it that way if you try to play up on the positive aspects of the religions and the worldviews. From humanism, the focus on basic needs. From Marxism, the same focus on basic needs. From liberalism, the focus on freedom and growth. And from Marxism, basic needs and distribution. So we have a peculiar habit of having all of a good idea separated in compartments. So why not, you know, fish something there and something there and something there. And uh, that is the, I think, purpose of dialogue. So that's why my way of hoping for European Union would be to have open dialogue but also enter into reconciliation of traumas they have created in the past. And I single out the Third World and China and Russia for that in particular. I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's at least the kind of thing I will try to stand for. Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, uh, my name is Witt. Uh, I'm from Turkey. And this is part of the reason why I want to express my... A bit closer to the now. And Thank my you. question will be about the sectarian conflict between Shias and Sunnis, especially in the Middle East. So do you think that is it just a mere conscience that uh, like Saudi Arabia and Turkey, uh, which are the Sunni majority countries, support the oppos opposition, opposition and on the other hand, the Shia majority countries support the uh, Assad regime? In terms of, in this sense, so, I mean, in the Iraq, also in the Afghanistan, we hear lots of uh, sectarian conflicts in those lands. So, do you believe that there will be clash not without with the civilization, but mm -hmm. in, in the civilizations, especially Shuni, Shuni, uh, Shias and Sunnis? Thank you very much. Thank you indeed for a very important point. You don't solve basic religious issues by democracy. It's not a question of arithmetic preponderance and majority. So, let me tell you <laughs> what happened in 1985 in Augsburg where Luther was denounced uh, right after 1517. And by the way, Luther never hammered with a hammer 95 theses. He was not good with a hammer, he was good with a pen. So this thing about the hammer is somebody's invention. But let's leave that aside, it's a very small point. So that will say that Luther was of the opinion that the road to salvation is through faith, and the church was of the opinion that it is through good deeds. So in 1985, after an enormous amount of discussion and debate and everything, the um, Ecumenical Council, Vatican, no, no, the Ecumenical Council in Geneva and the Vatican came together and agreed on a formula that a deep faith inspires the good deed and the good deed confirms the faith. Now, that formula sounds to me have a little bit of ring of the obvious, and you can, and, but it is excellent, the formula is excellent. You may ask, it's not that fantastic, the act of a genius, so couldn't they have invented that 400 years earlier? You know? In 1518, they could have invented that one. Well, they didn't, because it was not only a theological issue. It was a question of where is economic power located? Is it in the north with the Hansa, or is it in the Mediterranean? Is it obvious that Latin is the language, or could it be the German created by Luther, which Professor Koops is still talking? It's essentially Lutheran German, or Deutsch, and a fantastic innovation by one person. Actually. Now, if you look at all of that, the conflict was more complex, and the same is the case with Shia Sunni. And yet, I would love to see a meeting with the Shia Sunni people come together with Protestants, Catholics and compare notes. Because I have a feeling that there is some kind of formula they haven't found yet, which could unite them.
or take the agony out of the conflict. Now to that one counter argument is that it took the Christianity 400 years to come up with this formula. Sorry about that one. <laughs> but the point about Shia Sunni is that it is from the very beginning. Right after the death of the Prophet in 632. Who is the successor? How do we designate the successor? Is it through the Khalifat or is it through the biological successors or the son-in-law? And so on. Again, I have a feeling that some formula could be found. Uh, there was more, one more question there, I think, Nadia, and then final one over here. Hello, uh, my name is Nadia Minsaman. I'm a student uh, at the Science College of European Peace and Security Studies. And, um, Could you type the microphone a little bit more stabilized? I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> because we have this fantastic opportunity. Now you have to have your face a little bit more stabilized relative to the microphone. <laughs> 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 because we have this fantastic opportunity of seeing you and hearing your opinion live, so to speak, instead of just through the textbook, um, I felt you know, compelled to ask you this. Um, I know it's a more normative question compared to what's been asked thus far, but I wanted to ask you um, whether your description of the glittering success of the EU would also mean that the European uh, unification and con consolidation of the EU um, could be seen as a development towards the realization of a regional or European form of positive peace, or would this be eclipsed by the furthering of the military um, aspect of its foreign and security policy? I'm not quite sure I captured it. Could you repeat it for me? So the question is to what extent uh, the European Union is a kind of idea of positive peace or whether the military uh, militarization, so the development of the military arm um, of the EU foreign policy is kind of uh, undoing this. No. Yes, European Union is positive peace. It is remarkably equitable and it has the European Development Fund to try to increase the equity. And it has a lot of empathy with other members, which is quite clear in the present economic crisis. And your question is very well put. <clears throat> the um, thing about the military is that the United Nations had the wisdom of drawing a line between Chapter 6 and Chapter 7. So I was talking with the head of the European Union military today and I would like to share what we said because we agreed completely. He's an Austrian, a three-star general and um, so the point is peacekeeping, peacekeeping as opposed to peace enforcement, chapter 7. Now peace enforcement, in generally speaking, does not work. And he was asking me, what would be your image, my image, of the ideal peacekeeping? And I said, six points. Point one, military expertise. <clears throat> you have to know about weapons. Those of the rebels, you have to know about them. You have to know what to expect, how they work. And how you can take cover, how you can neutralize them. It's not the same as fighting. Avoid. Point two, police expertise, crowd control. And some states' police do that fantastically well. Point three, knowledge of nonviolence. Of positive nonviolence in confronting other people and how that can be done. Point four, you have to know about mediation. If you are sitting as a soldier in a room, and in the three other corners of the room is one Bosniak, one Croat, and one Serb, how do you open the conversation? So you know already what I would have said. Gentlemen, could you please tell me what does a good Yugoslavia look like? You should not open it by saying, may I serve you some drinks? not the way to treat the Muslim part of it. It would go down quite well with the Christians, with the Catholics and the Orthodox, but not with the Muslims. They're heavy drinkers, both of them. <coughs> but now, having said that, next point, 
point number five, 50% women. I made a study of men and women in Norwegian peacekeeping forces in Yugoslavia. And the men were more oriented towards binoculars, radar screens, handguns, and the women were oriented towards talking with people to find out what the whole thing was about. Now, you need some respect for metallic things, but very much for talking with people. So, 50% women. And point number six, make them so numerous that it's not only a question of a blue cap, but a blue carpet. Thousands swarming into the territory, Syria, interposing themselves between the killers on both sides, presenting them with a situation where there's no decent battlefield anywhere where you can fight. Go in between. Now, I have made this speech in the United Nations, and um, it is moving in this direction, slowly. But you see, it takes the power away from big powers with heavy weapons. It distributes it between genders and non-violence and all kinds of things. It does not in any way neglect military expertise. That expertise exists. So let me only say that um, the head of the EU military and I, we parted in an extremely friendly way. So. Good news for the UN as well. <laughs> okay, one final question over here. And uh, and of course there will be opportunity to informally keep on talking. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. I also have a question on the EU. Because you mentioned that it was a success in the way it brought peace uh, within its borders. And you said that it was exportable. But uh, my question is, do you really think this very Western-oriented peace project can be applied out of Europe to Middle East, for example? And don't you think it would be seen as another colonialist move? And sorry, one, one more? To your side? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just um, thinking about uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement, when you spoke about the solution for Syria, that you think is the best one. S but now, like f more than 15 years after the, the war in Bosnia, the biggest problem in Bosnia is the Dayton Peace Agreement with national vetoes and like more or less like territorial, uh, the two chamber, uh, chambers uh, solution. So why for Syria it would be different? Uh, and better the, the solution with national vetoes? Because the situations are different. Forget about the Dayton Agreement. It was a terrible mistake. You see, it was written in the cards they wanted to keep Bosnia Herzegovina. The truth about Bosnia Herzegovina is that it doesn't exist. The Croats in Bosnia Herzegovina, by their own vote, want to join Croatia. The Serbs do not want to join <coughs> Serbia. And that has to do with the fact that the Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina were not on the Titoist side. They were on the other side. They want their own republic, Republika Srpska. That leaves you with the 44% Bosniaks from Muslim. And they were at some point talking seriously about a Muslim Bosniak Republic centered on Sarajevo, where they have by far the majority, and then relatively small and extremely run by professionals, intellectuals, less agricultural than the others, and a city state. Now, I think one should respect people. And the Croats should join Croatia, the Serbs should have their own republic, and they might work out on the longer run the relationship between Serbia and Serbia. And the Bosniaks wanted their own city state. The reason why they don't have it is the foreign minister of England who vetoed it. I had some of my friends in the um, parties that know exactly what happened, and he said, We will not permit 
a Muslim state on European ground. Now, who is he to say that? Sitting up on that foggy island, foggy island in the North Sea, a little tiny island up in the North Sea, saying we are not going to permit. He has hardly joined Europe himself. He is a 51st state of the United States, and he doesn't like a Muslim state. I think that would have been the solution, and a much more positive. So, I think my experience is the Syrians somehow want to keep together. The Kurds, with whom I talk quite a lot, want high level of autonomy in Syria, and the Kurds in Iraq already have it, and they are getting it in Turkey due to Erdogan policy. The lagging country is Iran, which has a horrible way, a genocidal approach to the Kurds. But this is their long-term goal, which is a Kurdistan consisting of four autonomies, as Transcend formulated it in 1993. But they don't want to leave Syria. Syria is okay, whereas Bosnia-Herzegovina was not okay. It was imposed upon them. And then comes, of course, the basic question about Syria, and there are very many of them. Uh, does this process have a real chance? <clears throat> and wouldn't it just bring up the national antagonisms? Well, the national antagonisms are there. What they are looking for is protection. Right now, Sunni, Arabs, Islamists, from Qatar and Saudi Arabia, are doing the best to kill the Christians in a little village 40 kilometers from Damascus. It's going on right now as infidels. But these are extremist, fundamentalist Muslims. Usually Islam is very tolerant of Christianity and Jews, but there are exceptions. They want protection. So what is to me important is to preserve the protection offered them by Assad senior and junior, and expand it to the whole majoritarian Syria, which would mean some moderation on the Sunni side, but by and large they would run the country. It has a clear Sunni majority, but the respect for the other nations would be preserved. So that's what I'm trying to argue. Professor Gerton, um, thank you so much. May I um, perhaps take a kind of uh, liberty of the last and final question, and that is looking back on your very productive uh, intellectual and practical life, um, what would you say is your proudest or maybe most important achievement? And the second thing, given the fact that in this room are a variety of young uh, peace and security studies students that maybe at some point want to go into diplomacy, NGO work, or make some difference in the world, what would be your one advice you would give to those uh, students, kind of future generation? We start with a second. Look at um, your studies, the way medical people look at medical science. Diagnosis, prognosis, therapy. Diagnosis means analysis. That's what you learn. And you will definitely at this excellent university become very good at that. Try to be good at prognosis. That's the test of whether you have understood the system. And I can share with you that I am extremely impatient with professors of international studies who were unable to predict 9-11. Let alone the economists who were unable to predict 2008. It means they don't know the world. And it's good time to go back and start studying again. The question is which university? Now, having said that, prognosis is important. Therapy. You ask yourself, and I think the Americans formulate it in a sort of naive, simplistic way, which I love. Okay, okay, what are you going to do about it? And they very quickly get tired of analysis, you know, they want to jump a little bit too quickly, maybe, to what you're going to do about it. But I think that is the question. And here my advice would be, don't be afraid of launching ideas.
don't be afraid. But think them well through. And I have indicated to you a method, dialogue with all parties. And when you do that, you will discover that all parties have a valid point. So, one of the predecessors of Joachim Koops, his name was Adolf Hitler, and the question is, what was his name? <laughs> <laughs> so, I go to him and I say, Mr. Hitler, what is the image of the good Germany you would like to see? <laughs> and he says, <clears throat> not subject to the Versailles Treaty, which is a crime against the German people. The war was among the royal houses, and there's no reason why Germany should be singled out as the bad one, and the people should pay the burden for the burden. Then he would say a couple of more things, and I'll just mention, not mention them. I'll just say, Mr. Hitler, I found your first point extremely interesting. Would you care to develop that a little bit further? So, that would be the valid point in Hitler. And when I said that at the lecture at the University of Oxford, almost exactly the same, and I added that in 1924, five years after the Second Versailles Treaty, the First Versailles Treaty was in 1871. The second was 1919. When, in 1924, there was a pressure on the Allies to do something like that from some people, mainly peace organizations and some mediators and some politicians. This Versailles Treaty is not working, why don't we modify it or even scrap it? And that was not done, the Allies said, this is the punishment uh, Germany deserves entirely. And, when I and I said, if you had done that, you would have deprived Hitler of his best argument when he had a plebiscite in March 33, after the Machtergreifung, which was a Machtübergabe. He was not <coughs> grasping the power, he was given it by Hindenburg. But in March they had a plebiscite and he had a, in conjunction with, the, uh, with another party, they had 52-53%. He would never have gotten that if he hadn't had the Warsaw Treaty as an argument. Now, you deprive him then of his best argument. So I said that at University of Oxford, and a very famous professor, who is so famous that I'm not mentioning his name, stood up and said, Ha! So you are saying we are the guilty ones, not the Nazis. And I said, No. I'm saying you share the responsibility. And at the point in a major conflict and a war, talk a little bit less about guilt and innocence and a little bit more about degree of responsibility and how you could turn that in a more positive direction. So that in a sense is my basic answer to the question of um, the perennial question I get, namely, how do I keep going? Well, it works. And the example that I mentioned to you in the card, I'll just briefly repeat. I was asked by the Council of Europe in 1967 by the son of Werner Zombart, the fantastic economist sociologist. His name was Nicolas, Nicolas Zombart, head of the cultural department. And he liked this peace research thing and he said, We are in Brussels, could you have some dialogue? in NATO countries, Warsaw Treaty countries, and neutral non-aligned countries, we'll pay for it. So we agreed that I should have a dialogue in 19 countries, and it should be with the leading <coughs> policy-making person in the Foreign Office. Not the Foreign Minister, because he's often the one who has been drinking coffee in the party office and gets his reward as Deputy Prime Minister. But the top person, maybe the head of the political section of the ministry. And his name in Washington was Wigner Brzezinski. He was at that time three years older than me, and I can tell you he's still three years older than me. So there are certain constants in the world. And the name in Moscow was Yuri Varantsov, very famous for walking in the woods in Geneva. 
and similar people. Some people had brilliant, some states had brilliant people, some states had less brilliant people. The Irish said, for that question, Professor Galton, about foreign policy, would you please be so kind to ask London? For that question, would you please ask London? Because they're the one running our country's foreign policy. And in Eastern Europe, they did not say, please ask Moscow. They had very independent views, more independent on Moscow than the NATO countries on Russia. Anyhow, I asked them, 19 countries, 25 questions. How would you like to handle this problem and that problem and that problem? And they said, the best solution we have is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. We cooperate, all of us. And we have these roads with the green road sign, E15, E1, and so on, E6, and all of that, connecting North and South and East and West. And our major problem is security. We are afraid of the Cold War getting hot, and even nuclear. So I came up with a proposal, which was called an act of genius. I'll tell you, it was not that genius. I just said, how about the United Nations Security Commission for Europe? So I presented that in about 12 of the 19 countries. And in Czechoslovakia, in Prague, at that time Czechoslovakia, the um, foreign minister, who later on became a dissident, who moved to Paris, Snydarek said, brilliant suggestion, but time is not right. So now we make a little jump because you're asking for what was it that pleased me most. And we make a jump to 1993, 26 years. And in the meantime, the Cold War is over and quite a lot has happened. And I'm at a conference in Luxembourg and the main speaker is Samuel Huntington, who happened to be a very good friend of mine. We disagreed about everything, we were just very good friends. And we lived in the same apartment house, close to Columbia University. He was considered a coming man in political science, and I in sociology. There they were on. I left sociology for paxology, for peace research. But anyhow, I was the second speaker. After that, there was a reception. It was terrible Luxembourg champagne. <laughs> the kind of champagne that should be... Uh, I mean, why do you have Nuremberg? It's just a crime against humanity. <laughs> and the peanuts were soggy. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. And up to me came a tall man and said, Professor Galton, thanks for your speech. You don't know me. I have a story to tell you. I am the Czech ambassador to Paris. And when I was 29 years old, this is the root of my fascination with 29 years old, you see. But I can be generous, plus minus two. I was sitting in the back of the room and you were giving a talk about the Security Commission for Europe and the Foreign Minister said, excellent, but the time is not right. I was a Dubček man, they made me kindergarten teacher in Northern Czechoslovakia. When the Cold War was over, I became Deputy Foreign Minister. And I am the Foreign Minister. We had one problem, get the Soviet troops out because they came the night between 20 and 21st August 1968 and stayed. Get them out. So we wrote a letter to the Georgian foreign minister, Shevardnadze, and he said, no, we will not pull them out. We will have a successor system to the Warsaw Pact, a more democratic Warsaw Pact, like NATO. Now, if he thought NATO was democratic, he was badly informed, but uh, let's leave that aside. Uh, that it consists of democracies is not the same as making NATO democratic, but we leave that aside. So, they were desperate, and then the former 29 years old then said to his boss, the foreign minister, he was just a deputy, how about the Galton plan? Maybe time is right. So, my own view of foreign ministries, they're not good at creativity, but they're good at filing. So they found the Galton plan on the I for idiot, or something like that. <laughs> so it was pulled out and was sent to Shevardnadze. 
And Shevardnadze said, according to this former 29 years old, excellent plan, I come next week, we will pull the troops out on the condition that Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union, at the time still Soviet Union, we are talking about early 1990, together at the peace conference in Paris, will propose an organization for security and cooperation of Europe in line with that plan. Now, in the meantime, the Finns, Helsinki, and of course made a very good step forward. So he looked at me and said, Professor Galton, you were the father of the plan. I was the one who executed it. I want to congratulate you. And I can reveal to you one thing, the champagne tasted better. <laughs> Even the peanuts were less soggy. That afternoon I made a couple of telephone with this disturbing a couple of telephone calls. I apologize for that one. I'm not able to switch it off. And transcend was founded. And I forgave Luxembourg for both champagne and peanuts. Excellent. And I keep my fascination with 29 years old in the back of the room. Thank you. So both the founder of OSCE in a sense intellectually and, and of Transcend. Professor Galvin, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you ever so much for, for all your insights. I must say, uh, as I said at the beginning, it was my uh, uh, dream also at some point to have you uh, as a guest lecturer. I didn't know that I, as a result, would be called the successor to Hitler, but okay, I, I, uh, I, I forgive you for that. It's the collective guilt. It's the collective guilt, absolutely. Sure, we can talk sure. about that. But we have a bit more... Try to get away from it. <laughs> We have a bit more time um, if you want. Uh, outside, onto the right side, there is a reception. I hope the peanuts won't be too soggy and uh, let's hear about the champagne. So please join us all and, and Professor Galtung uh, over there. Thank you.